welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. So, in this one, we're going to talk about self-esteem. And it's, again, I would imagine something you're very familiar with, but maybe have difficulty defining it, understanding it, and maybe haven't really thought too much about ways you could improve it. And it's interesting. Have you ever connected self-esteem with the inner critic or the voice inside your head? What about the imposter syndrome, something you might have heard of in the last few years more and more, and how that ties to self-esteem? If you've taken on a new job or were given a promotion, have you felt that fear of, God, am I good enough for this? What I'm, if I'm found out that I'm not? That definitely connects very closely to self-esteem, which is very much the, the value or worth you put on, on yourself. The word itself, esteem, is around respect and admire. If you think of my, my esteemed colleague, you're putting them into a position of uh, respect and admiration. And as we talked about self numerous times and went into the details of self, bringing it back to yourself, how much value or worth you put on yourself. And we will, and I will definitely go into examples of inner critic and how it ties into that. Let's talk a little bit about the history of self-esteem because that's uh, certainly something I think is good to give a a starting point and and a foundation on. Like a lot of these terms, every time I dive into the background and history, I, I'm surprised how relatively new they are and they haven't been around for hundreds of years. But the self-esteem movement has swept through Western culture only in the last 50 years, with parents and teachers alike doubling down on the idea that improving children's self-confidence, which is very close to self-esteem, will lead to improved performance and a more successful life in general. And that is, as I said, always surprising that uh, this has only been around 50 years. This movement started with a book published in 1969 in which psychologist Nathaniel Brandon argued that most mental or emotional problems people faced could be traced back to low self-esteem. Brandon laid the foundation for the self-esteem movement with his assertion that improving an individual's self-esteem could not only result in better performance, but could even cure pathology. And just brief definition of what pathology is, if you didn't know, it's it's the science of the causes and effects of diseases. So if you're curing pathology with high self-esteem, you're effectively curing a potential disease that that you have by having higher self-esteem. So there's probably a bit of a placebo effect going on there. So since the 1969 movement began, there's been thousands of papers published and books, studies conducted on the relationship between success and self-esteem. And this is a popular idea, not only in literature, but in more mainstream mediums as well. It's important to know the differences between self-esteem, self-efficacy and self-confidence. We've done self-confidence and we will do the next one on self-efficacy, but it's important to separate them out. But we'll just go more and more deep into self-esteem in this one. So what is self-esteem? So the name you'll probably hear most talked about, mentioned Nathaniel Brandon, there's another gentleman, Morris Rosenberg, and he's one that comes up a lot during the next um, few minutes. They're the most influential voices in self-esteem research. And in 1965, uh, the book Society and the Adolescent Self-Image, Rosenberg discusses his take on self-esteem and introduced his widely used accepted and accepted self-esteem scale, which I'll provide a link to at the end. And it's one of the measurements of how you can measure your level of self-esteem. His definition of self-esteem rested on the assumption that it is a relatively stable belief about one's overall self-worth. It is a broad definition of self-esteem, defining it as a trait that is influenced by many factors and is relatively difficult to change. That's Rosenberg's definition. And the other gentleman, Brandon, just to give you a different perspective, he believes that self-esteem is made up of two distinct components, self-efficacy, which we will go into detail uh, on the next one, or 
the confidence, uh, which, he, which he, he explains here, is the confidence we have in our own abilities to cope with life's challenges. And the other part is self-respect or the belief that we are deserving of happiness, love and success, that, that we deserve that. And having self-respect is tied closely to that. While the definitions are similar, it is worth noting that Rosenberg's definition relies on the beliefs about self-worth, which generally seems to be the more accepted one, uh, which although can have wildly different meanings to different people, um, it is a bit broader, while Brandon is more specific about what beliefs are involved in self-esteem. As we further define it, over the last while, few years, those that have too much self-esteem have become known as narcissists, and that is definitely something we see more and more of in the in the, in the current climate and to certain world leaders with a, a touch of that, if not lots of it. The psychological definition would be an extreme amount of selfishness with a grandiose view of one's own talent and a craving for admiration. So, you know, that's a, a little bit of a definition of narcissism and you know, we hear it bandied about a lot and we talk about people being narcissistic. And I think uh, narcissism comes from um, one of the Greek gods, I guess, Narcissus, I believe, um, who, who tends to, to love himself and his own reflection. But think about it, that definition and the fine line between having high self-esteem and becoming a narcissist. Self-esteem at high and low levels can be damaging, so it is important to strike a balance in the middle. A realistic but positive view of the self is often ideal. This piece further goes into three typical components which make up self-esteem, so let me call those out. Self-esteem is an essential human need that is vital for survival and normal and healthy development. Self-esteem arises automatically from within based on a person's beliefs and consciousness and self-esteem occurs in conjunction with a person's thoughts, behaviours, feelings and actions. Self-esteem is one of the most basic human motivations in Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, Maslow would suggest that individuals need both esteem from others as well as the inner self-respect. And these needs must be fulfilled in order for an individual to grow and thrive. These needs must be fulfilled for an individual to grow and achieve self-actualization as well, which is the top of Maslow's pyramid. Self-confidence and self-esteem are two closely related psychological phenomena based on past experiences and both looking towards a future performance. And if you remember our definition of self-confidence, it is a lot of past experiences giving you that uh, expectation or belief that you can achieve your goals into the future. Um, and it is quite tightly close, closely linked to self-esteem. So we're going to get deeper into this area. And to allow me to do that, I am going to be reading pieces from a book on self-esteem by a gentleman, Matthew McKay, and another called Patrick Fanning, uh, a proven program for cognitive techniques for assessing, improving and maintaining your self-esteem. That's where we're getting a lot of the information on how it ties into emotional intelligence. So that's coming up right now. Each individual manifests self-esteem or the lack of it differently. Generally, people with strong self-esteem had parents who nurtured them constantly during their early childhood, while those with low self-esteem often, and often is the key word there, did not. Can people with low self-esteem build it as adults? Absolutely. And again, that's why it's part of the emotional intelligence framework. It's something you can develop. It's something you can grow. You just have to put the tools or use the tools to get there. And it is very much about how you feel about yourself and, and controlling your thoughts and feelings. And as we talk about being self-aware, it's just connecting into those feelings and understanding what they're, uh, what they're about and not allowing them to develop and grow and, and take control. If you command your thoughts, you can command your feelings, including your sense of self. We've definitely touched on that a lot already. Some key points, uh, facts maybe about self-esteem. It is essential to your well-being. Your self-esteem depends first on how your parents treated you as a small child. Again, going back to this nature-nurture idea. So for me, as I read this and as I put this together with somebody as uh, somebody with a 15-month-old, 
and you know keeping very close eyes on on the words and the language and the, the activities you you do and and probably continue to do it's very important to uh, to be aware of how we can develop self esteem in others positive self esteem does not depend on being rich attractive intelligent or popular to improve your self esteem improve your thinking believe in your worth and there's a lot of examples coming up the differences between low and high self esteem so that will be hopefully helpful as we clarify that. I mentioned this idea of the inner critic at the start and how that ties into self-esteem. I think uh, it must be nearly 10 years ago I went to um, a counsellor at the time um, just going through some stuff myself and she did an exercise with me where she got me to um, after maybe talking about some of the thoughts that I was having or some of the things that were going on she said you, you give yourself, there's an awful lot of self-talk, a lot of negative talk going on. You're giving yourself a very hard time. And while I was aware of that, I was never really separated from it that much. So she got me to do an exercise of naming that self-talk. What does the person or it look like as well? Putting a label on it. Um, this inner critic, which I, I would call a little gremlin or a little devil, and he would sit on my, typically on my right shoulder and he'd have a, a trident and was not there to really, uh, it didn't feel like he was there to help me. In some instances, they're there to uh, keep you safe, but others, if you let them, they can uh, they can go a bit crazy. So the, the term pathological critic uh, comes up in this self-esteem part and it is considered a fierce antagonist inside your head that does everything possible to undermine your self-esteem. And I'm just hoping this connects in with you. And one of the most powerful exercises I did was be able to label that thing, that person that inside my head and, and helped me uh, separate from it. Ironically, this critic is also there to help alleviate anxiety and help keep you in a good place. But people automatically assume its internal critic is uh, legitimate uh, and what it's telling you is is the truth. But in fact, they're they're not. It's important to try and become aware of that and then you start building a relationship with it, learn to silence it and change the talk track that it's telling you that's no doubt probably bringing your self-esteem down. You need to develop mechanisms and tools to, to kind of push it the other way and we'll get into that. Visualization is one that we mentioned in self-confidence and you can definitely use that here in self-esteem as well. So it's just important to kind of be aware that that voice or, or whatever it is that's going on inside you, you can change that and make that more of a positive impact. And it, again, just about being aware. Okay, so we'll go back to some of the readings from the book here. Self-esteem is how you value yourself and your abilities, regardless of how anyone else values you or your abilities. This is what makes self-esteem rather than the esteem of others. That's what makes it self-esteem rather than the esteem from others. For example, let's say you think very positively of yourself and your capabilities, while everybody else in the world thinks very negatively of you and your capabilities. In this case, you have very high self-esteem, even though other people's esteem of you is very low. Or consider the opposite as an example. Let's say you think very little of yourself and your capabilities, while everyone in the world thinks very highly of you and your capabilities. In this instance, you have low self-esteem, even though other people's esteem is very high of you. That makes total sense, right? You can be perceived to have high, high esteem from others, but, but for yourself, it could be rock bottom. Even though it sounds very simple and straightforward, it's important for you to understand that self-esteem is created by the way you value yourself, the worth you put on yourself, rather than the way others value you. Because this simple insight will ultimately be the key to building high self-esteem quickly and easily. And I'm, I'm reading the word quickly there, but I don't always believe in quick building because it doesn't tend to last. Okay, more on where does self-esteem come from? Once it's clear that self-esteem is created by you, by the way you value yourself and your capabilities, which I hope you can think a little bit about now, but you can see it, it becomes very clear that self-esteem comes from within you and the thoughts going on inside that head of yours. 
This means that self-esteem does not come from anything that exists outside of you or your mind, like friends or family or incredible achievements that you've made. It really comes from within, emphasizing that. To appreciate this, let's say that you have extremely supportive friends and family and every day they tell you you're the best in the world, you're just amazing. You can still have extremely low self-esteem by still thinking of yourself as a loser because your self-esteem thoughts come from how you think about yourself, not from the thoughts of others, not from the actions of others, totally from yourself, self, self, self. Flip that around. Say you've achieved amazing things in life, like creating a wonderful family, building a successful business, you're running marathons, you're a high achiever. You could still have very low self-esteem by thinking very little about your achievements or those achievements. And, And I've experienced that and you would see that in people, you know that you would say, wow, that person has huge and high self-esteem, but you might be wondering how. <clears throat> and on the flip side, you might know somebody that has so many achievements, has, has it looks from the outside to have it all going on, but they're struggling because they just haven't been able to develop their own self-esteem. Because, as we know now, it's your thoughts about those capabilities and achievements, although they're amazing, you may not just be able to put value or worth on those. The lesson here is self-esteem comes from within you and within the thoughts in your mind, not anything else. So even if you appear to have nothing going for you, you could still have high self-esteem. You could be very high self-value, self-worth. And on the flip side, you could be have all the money in the world, all the friends and all the family and everybody around you adore you but if you're not telling yourself the right message you're not going to have that high self-esteem so that means if you want to have higher self-esteem it's something you can impact it's about improving your thinking so that you can have higher self-esteem you can have value yourself more and that's great news right if you can apply some of the tools that we'll talk about or read further in it and put some practices in place, you can boost your self-esteem over time. Okay, as we go through each of these episodes, we we try to break it down into different sections. And the next one is about why self-esteem is so important. Just because you can change the way you think about yourself to develop higher self-esteem, why would you bother doing it? To appreciate why it's so important to improve your self-esteem, it's helpful to think of self-esteem as being something that helps lift you up in life, while low self-esteem is something that drags you down. High self-esteem is is a lot like hot air uh, in a hot air balloon that can keep you buoyant, whereas low self-esteem is like carrying a bag of rocks or a, a rucksack of rocks that's holding you down and preventing you from going anywhere. Think about it though, when you have high self-esteem, when you're in that moment of high self-esteem, you can naturally hold your head higher. You're looking at people, you're feeling in control, you're confident and you're able to interact with others. You have a just everything sense of belief comes comes out and it's it's obvious people can see that. That again ties in with success. On the flip side, when you have low self esteem, you're going through a period of low self esteem, you're probably hanging your head. You don't want to make eye contact. Your body language is is very bad, it's poor, it's negative, it just there's no energy. You're naturally less happy, less confident, and that translates definitely to less success. So self-esteem is definitely important because it can affect every experience you have in life. So keep in mind, though, that it's not right to have high self-esteem or wrong to have low self-esteem. It's not a question of being right or wrong. The truth, though, is why would you want to have low self-esteem? From the research I've done and from my experiences, there's no real upside to that. It's better to have high self-esteem in every way, which is why using some of these tools, again, you can grow that and it's something you should put effort into because there's only really good upside from having high self-esteem. And now just for a minute, let's kind of look at the differences between self-esteem and self-confidence because I've used those words interchangeably touched on self-confidence before, but just to kind of maybe level set, there is a strong connection without doubt between the two, but they're definitely not the same thing. The best way that I've been able to find 
to appreciate the difference and explain the difference is that they're definitely related, but they're not the same thing. And if you think about it, self-esteem can be something that naturally leads to self-confidence. As is self-confidence, come back to that Venn diagram that I talked about before with self-efficacy, um, I think self-confidence is the bigger circle. And within that circle, there's a, an intersection or maybe it's fully consumed. Self-esteem is in there. And as you build self-esteem, that will naturally lead to more self-confidence. Increasing your self-esteem produces the desired effect of greater self-confidence. So think of self-esteem as being the way in which you think about yourself and the way in which you think about yourself naturally makes you either more self-confident or more or less self-confident. Just to touch on a couple of theories of self-esteem that gives you a bit more background, something you can read more into as well. One is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this is the, the one that's been around since the 40s, even before self-esteem was properly defined and has probably a bit of outdating going on, but it's worth talking about. In his framework, he theorizes that there are several needs that humans must have to meet to be truly fulfilled. But in general, the most basic needs must be met before complex ones can be. So it's the, the pyramid effect and it's layering uh, one on top of the other. In the pyramid, self-esteem is the second highest level of need just under self-actualization, which is the top. According to Maslow, humans must have their needs of psychological stability, safety, love and belonging met before they can develop healthy self-esteem. He also noted that there are two kinds of self-esteem, a higher and a lower. The lower self-esteem derived from the respect of others, while the higher self-esteem comes from within. So there is a link from, from Maslow. In the years following this introduction from the 40s, Maslow refined his theory to accommodate the instances of highly self-actualized people who are homeless or individuals who live in a dangerous war zone but are also high in self-esteem so that there was a mismatch in the original areas that uh, he probably didn't accommodate for but that, that as it evolved included that. The hierarchy is no longer considered as a strict theory of unidirectional growth, but a more general explanation of how basic needs met, being met allow individuals the freedom and ability to achieve their more complex ones. Another theory, the sociometer theory, Mark Leary, a social psychologist who researches self-esteem in the context of evolutionary psychology, also contributed to a theory of self-esteem. The sociometer theory, pronouncing it hopefully that's okay, suggests that self-esteem is an internal gauge of the degree to which one is included versus excluded by others. And this theory rests on the conception of self-esteem as an internal individual perception of social acceptance and rejection. So it's it's tied both internal and external, um, internal what you can tell yourself and external what others think of you. So it's kind of bringing a little bit of both in and that's where the relationships and social connections come in and the third part of the emotional intelligence framework that we'll get to. There is some strong evidence for the accuracy and application of this theory. For example, studies have shown that the outcomes of events on people's self-esteem generally match up with their assumptions of how the same events would cause other people to accept or reject them. Finally, evidence shows that social exclusion based on personal characteristics decreases self-esteem. So while the majority of the thinking, I suppose, before this had been self-esteem, something you completely control and build up yourself, his theory, from what I extract from it, has a, an impact of how others see you, that if you're getting a sense that they don't look at you in a positive light or don't have belief in you, that can definitely internalize and you can start telling yourself different uh, thoughts and different stories that can have an impact on your self-esteem. So just two theories there. There's probably lots more out there, but I think it's important to share a little bit more depth on it. Okay, let's go into examples of how low self-esteem decreases self-confidence. To better understand the connection between self-esteem and self-confidence, Let's say you think about yourself in the following ways. I'm fat and I'm ugly. I'm a loser. 
I'm a failure in life. In this case, I wonder what type of self-esteem you have. Yes, it's definitely low because you're thinking about yourself in a very negative way. And this naturally makes you feel less confident, especially since it produces other types of thoughts that make you doubt yourself and your capabilities. So telling yourself those bad, negative, terrible words, sentences can not have a good impact. And maybe even as I read it out, I feel something when I say those words. You can instantly internalize it. And if you if I say it and you're listening and you think about those things or other things come up in your mind that makes you feel not so good, just see how, how impactful those words can have. Back to the reading. For example, with this type of self-esteem, you naturally think thoughts like other people won't like me or I'll never achieve what I want to achieve. So it's that's the starting sentence and it starts to escalate and you can go into a spiral. The negative way in which you value yourself naturally makes you not believe in yourself and makes you think more negatively and pessimistically about your future. And this is why self-confidence goes down as a result. It's this vicious circle. What you really want to be doing is trying to create a virtuous circle, the opposite. And maybe with positive affirmations, you can do that. Here's an example. Uh, The flip side. Let's say, what do you think about yourself when I say the following? I'm attractive. I'm a great person. I'm very successful at achieving things that I want to achieve. What do you feel when you say those out loud for yourself? In this instance, self-esteem is very high because you value and think about yourself in a positive way. This naturally makes you feel more self-confident, especially since it produces other types of thoughts that make you believe in yourself and your capabilities without doubting yourself at all. With this type of self-esteem, you naturally think other thoughts. What other thoughts come up when you hear those? Maybe people will like me or I want to achieve what I want to achieve. I can do this. This is within my control. I'm going to succeed. And those things are much more positive and uplifting. And as you tell yourself this, you can start feeling a little bit better and, and more confident comes so that the connection is so tight and hopefully even by just doing that simple example you can see the difference the benefits of self-esteem so kind of a natural progression from the importance and why it's important and now the benefits among the benefits of high self-esteem is that a person feels very good about him or herself they're confident with what they can do and they see themselves as a person worthy of other people's respect. Meanwhile, a person with low self-esteem may feel that their opinions and ideas do not matter, and that they don't deserve other people's recognition. High self-esteem is not only important in children, but absolutely in adults as well. Self-esteem can be developed by personal relationships, individual experiences, and by one's own thoughts. A well-developed self-esteem promotes mental stability, assertiveness, and much more. When you think about self-esteem, and we've been talking about how you your, you can develop your own self-esteem and how important it is to change your thought track and work on that, the environment and other factors can have an impact on the development of self-esteem. Your position in society, so if you are considered a leader or a manager or have a role that has in societal views importance, that can give you that internal belief that you have importance as well and that can help with your self-esteem. And other things, like not only how others see you, but if you're connected to a religion, um, the culture you're in, be it nationally, locally, uh, or at work, and your experience. Absolutely, the experience you've gained and the lessons you've learned can have a big impact on your your overall self-esteem. The relationship you have with the people closest to you, like your parents, your siblings, your friends at school or work, has the most influence in the development of your self-esteem Positive reception and feedback from these people develop your self-esteem for sure. 
And among the factors that affect the development of your self-esteem, your thoughts and your perceptions are not the only things you can control. If you refrain from negativity and always try to think about the positives, that'll definitely give you a boost. A high self-esteem can make you a better person. If you value all the positive things about yourself, you will be able to establish positive relationships with other people. You will also be able to perform well in the things that you do, whether they're at home, in school, or at work. Aside from that, you will also be able to learn things much more easily as you're able to progress, process feedback, negative and positive, and use it to develop yourself. So just in summary, benefits of self-esteem, some seven benefits that are listed here. You don't waste your time thinking about the things that you can't do, but think more about the things that you can do better in your situation. You can freely express your ideas and needs, and that's probably to be said for confidence as well. You have the ability to and confidence in making the right decisions. You can establish and maintain healthy relationships with others when you have high self-esteem. You're less critical of yourself and to others. And again, thoughts become feelings and become beliefs. And as you do that, if they're negative, you can get yourself into a stressed situation. And that can lead to uh, not only emotional, but physical damage. So it's, it's so critical that you're thinking positively and building your high self-esteem. You're less critical of yourself and others. I mentioned that one. You can handle stressful situations better and adapt well to unfamiliar circumstances. We're going through the coronavirus crisis right now as I'm recording this. It's Today's the 17th of March. I'm not sure what date this will come out. And the last five or six days have been massively stressful. And whether it's a self-esteem thing, there's definitely an element of that. But being more aware of what's going on, trying to detach from it, separate yourself from it, not to let these crazy thoughts that do start spiral can all help. Ad- and, and by doing that, you can adapt to these very unfamiliar circumstances and hopefully get through this. And finally, you're not prone to develop mental health conditions. With high self-esteem, you generally are more positive, optimistic, maybe pragmatic, realistic, but um, with low self-esteem, it's definitely on the other other side of the scale for sure. And just to finish on the benefits, self-esteem is essential for psychological survival. Life is tough enough as it is. It's brutal and can be unforgiving. So how can you survive? Build your self-esteem. If you feel that you do not deserve such a rough time, then you merit that you merit good experiences, not bad ones, then get up and fight back. What if you do not possess this vital spur of self-worth? Then you get into deeper trouble. You start to kick yourself while you're down and that's no way to win a fight. You need a proper sense of self-esteem to give yourself a chance to prevail against your challenges. Without it, you can end up on the ropes. Affirm yourself and you will win. Reject yourself and you lose. This is life's most basic rule. Without self-esteem, you will judge yourself too harshly, fear others, shun risk, and limit yourself in every way. You are certain you will fail. Life becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of defeat and dread. And as you try to get by with excuses and maladaptive self-destructive behavior, things don't work out so good. You try everything from bravado to anger to perfectionism, and potentially even go down the road of drugs or overeating or alcohol to deal with your inferior complex uh, and inferior pain. Of course, since you were always so critical of yourself, this is just what you deserve. No, absolutely not. Change the talk track, change the stream of words and language you're telling yourself, change the narrative and start moving in the right direction. Before I go into the how to improve your self-esteem, and we've touched on it a little bit, I want to read a little bit more about this idea of the the critic, the inner voice, the pathological critic, as it is called by uh, one of these authors, Eugene Sagan is the gentleman's name. I'm going to read through a bit about this, a bit more about that. Again, trying to raise the awareness of this in your own head, of what it is and whatever it is for you, it can be a lot of different things. And then how to... How to shut it up, because that's what it's all about. Poor self-esteem shows up as that nagging, carping little voice inside your head. 
psychologic psychologist Eugene Sagan calls it the pathological critic. This inner voice exists inside everyone's mind, but for those with poor self-esteem, it becomes a vicious detractor, a malignant backbiter that is always censoring and insulting. The voice itself can be masculine, feminine, or even asexual. For me, that little devil is a male's voice, although I can't really detect what tone it is in, but I can certainly, it's more I can, uh, it's not even you can hear it, you can almost see the words uh, visually. Um, Often it can sound like one of your parents. Each day your pathological critic works overtime to undermine everything that you can do, feel and think. And the time of my life when it was, uh, it was at its most rampant, because I was dealing with some stuff that I had difficulty trying to, to get off my chest and talk to other people about. And it just got louder and louder and it just consumed nearly every thought. And that the only time I could get away from it was when I was working or running or doing something else. Um, but as soon as that was done, it would come back in. And until I started to put a name on it and kind of relate with it, uh, it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't change. But... It's all about the uh, awareness. So <clears throat> how can such a hateful presence exist in your head? It hides among the other mental bric-a-brac stored there, just out of sight, but never out of mind. It is devilishly clever. Maybe that's why you call it the devil. It couches its attacks against you so that they seem logical and reasonable, even when they're apparently and patently absurd. Indeed, <coughs> indeed, they may seem as normal to you as water seems to a fish. The critic deals in constant negative reinforcement, which is powerful and addictive. It colors your thinking process and eases your pain. What makes this truly insidious is its occasional variable ratio in reinforcement aspect. And that's in inverted commas. Check that out. Variable ratio reinforcement. Think of it like a slot machine. It rewards players on a variable basis. Sometimes they play 25 coins before hitting their jackpot, sometimes 250 coins. This variability reinforces the behavior of putting money into the machine. The gambler thinks, I'm sure to win if I keep feeding coins into the slot. So that's what the player does. Similarly, your critics' attacks often reinforce themselves on a variable basis. The critic says, if you don't work until you drop, you won't achieve anything. Most of the time, you cannot meet this impossibly high standard, but sometimes you can and you can hit your goal. Thus, the critic's message variably reinforces itself. So just pausing for a second there, as I think back, I guess for me it was the critic was challenging me to be more honest and open about certain things I might have been holding back to certain people and it was making me absolutely question my self-worth and these things although were big in my head probably and weren't when when they were talked about to others weren't that big of a deal but because I was holding it back the critic was holding me to account massively for that and exploding everything out of all proportion Uh, and the more I held it back the more Difficult to become. So yeah, just uh, definitely at the time not aware of it, but once you face it and overcome it, uh, it, it shuts it up a little bit. How to shut up your critic. To quiet your critic, first you must hear it. This is not easy. Your mind is engaged in a constant inner monologue. Separating the critic's voice from the other noise in your head isn't easy. And since the critic's message is often nonverbal, pinpointing it is even harder. And that's interesting. Back to the point, it wasn't, I couldn't hear the words, I could just see them. Except, expect the critic to show up when you meet somebody new, make an error, to feel on the defensive, deal with an authority figure, provoke somebody's anger or disapproval, or worry about failure. The pathological critic is busy undermining your self-worth every day of your life. Yet his voice is so insidious, woven into the fabric of your thought, that you never notice its devastating effect. Mm. So hopefully you do notice it now. And we're going to talk about tools, how to develop and improve self-esteem next. Okay, so I have a list of tools and techniques or approaches here 
that I will pick out a number from over the next 10 or so minutes to give you some good context and concrete examples that you could try. And I'll probably then put all of them in these kind of rough notes I put together into the show notes. Or if you need more information, either reach out or just Google them. Um, There's lots of good stuff there. To put some various cognitive techniques to work to improve your self-esteem, here's a list. And uh, assessing your self accurately is one such technique write down how you look what your personality is like how well you do at work and so on plus put a plus sign on the positive notes and a minus sign by the negatives now list all the negatives on a sheet of paper don't use pejoratives just be matter of fact on a separate sheet of paper expansively describe your positive attributes when you're done Write out more accurate descriptions, memorize it, and use it the next time your critic harps at you. Say, hold on a minute, you're not there judging me, I'm kind, smart, and hardworking. Accurate self-assessment involves two things, one, acknowledging and remembering your strengths, and two, describing your weaknesses accurately, specifically, and non-prejoratively. And this is all again tying back to the critic example Don't let him or her get away with these cognitive distortions. These include overgeneralizations such as I ask not, I better not ask anyone in my group out on a date. I tried that with Sally and she turned me down. Global labeling, another cognitive distortion, always involves disparaging cliches. My home is a hellhole as an example. I'm a worthless piece of trash. Don't buy into such obvious nonsense. Shout back at your critic that it is wrong. Have compassion for yourself and understand your real motivations. Don't overheat because as your critic tells you, you're weak and have no discipline. Maybe you overeat and because you're nervous about some problem or other and uh, eating relieves that strain. Accept the reality of your situation, but don't say I'm a disgusting amount of blubber. Say instead, I'm overweight. I don't like it, but I will withhold judgment about it. Forgive yourself. Say I overeat because I'm nervous. One day I hope to conquer this feeling, but for now, today, I will drop all injurious charges against myself. My life is too valuable to spend it beating myself up. Here's another. Avoid thinking in shoulds. I should never make any errors. I should work every minute. No one is perfect, including you. When you make a mistake, it is not a grievous sin. See your mistakes as teachers or warning signs. Begin again and look at what you can learn. When somebody criticizes you, don't internalize his or her remarks. Many people do not see the things clearly and routinely misjudge others. They misinterpret everything based on their own emotions and prejudices. Unfortunately, people with lower self-esteem are always ready to believe the worst about themselves. Don't fall into that trap. Never let other people's notions about you bring you down. Instead, assert yourself. Ask for exactly what you want. Don't say, let's get out of here when you're uncomfortable, when you are in an uncomfortable situation. Say, instead, this room is packed. I can't hear myself think. Do you mind if we go? This is an example. Another one. Visualize positive scenes to enhance your self-esteem. Visualization has come up a few times, and this is another one. See yourself as a worthy, popular, at ease, and confident person. Imagine yourself getting a raise, hitting a home run, American example, scoring a goal, or winning a marathon. Visualization is remarkably effective and is becoming more and more popular. The subconscious interprets the images you create in your mind as being real, as the external reality your senses perceive. Perform your visualization. Perform your visualization exercises, say twice a day, when you get up and when you go to bed. To visualize, first deeply relax. Start with a simple image, a blue circle on a gray background. Then change the circle's color to yellow. Now change the circle to a red triangle. To be complete, Compassion must be directed towards others as well as towards yourself. Next, work on sounds. Listen for a bell, a horn, a car engine. Imagine touch. Feel the back of a metal chair, a pebble or a feather. 
Work up from simple images to more complex ones. During your next session, stare in the mirror. Memorize your appearance. To follow up, visualize yourself. Keep your eyes closed and relax. See yourself. Use a step-by-step approach. For example, if you are shy, start by seeing yourself speaking relaxed in a relaxed manner with one person, then speaking animatedly in a group, and finally at a podium before a large audience. During after the visualization session, use positive affirmations. I do my best and I love myself. So that's just an example of a visualization, a kind of a small one that you can build up over time and um, Google visualizations, examples, techniques, and I think you'll get some interesting results out of that. So those were kind of ones that are around helping fight back against that inner critic. Here are some more that are a bit more general that I hope you will get something from. Okay, so how to develop slash overcome low self-esteem or develop your your self-esteem to be higher. Here's a few other ideas that you might try. Some of these are kind of coaching tools that we would have used and continue to use. Um, Could be applied in confidence-focused work as well. But the first one that uh, I think I mentioned before is think about and write a mission statement for yourself. What is your mission in life? or in work, or in whatever specific area. And then when you do that, keep a a copy of it in a drawer, keep it close, print it out, put it on your screensaver, or your backdrop, uh, wallpaper, something like that on your desktop that you can see it on a regular basis. It will absolutely help you remind yourself about what you're focused on, and give you a sense of quiet pride, give you a sense of determination and can definitely help you inspire yourself to keep moving forward. Here's an example of one that I found, and it might be a bit lengthy, but it'll give you some ideas and then maybe some approaches to do it. I believe in myself, and I believe that I have a purpose on this earth. My values include spending time with my family, doing my very best to give my employer a hard day's work, and giving back to my community. I love the challenge of investigating and solving thorny problems in medical billing and being a source of information and inspiration for less experienced employees. So I'll pause there. Like all of that stuff ties into getting clear on your values, clear on your purpose and what you want to give back to the world as well as to yourself and getting satisfaction and meaning from that. I mentioned the values podcast and blog I've done in the past, seven steps to find out your, devise your own core values. Check that out. Uh, there'll be a link with this as well. But it's real work that you need to do to get very clear. And that will definitely tie into your own mission. Further to this one, dealing with human relations problems is something and sometimes a challenge for me, this is the example, but I will continue to try and listen with concern and compassion before judging. I value participation among my employees and strive not to give all the answers or make all the decisions. I will not allow my work to take up all of my time. I will spend quality time each day with my family, each and every week. I will do something to give back to the community and try to make the world a better place. Good example, touches on a lot. And the thing that came up for me near the end there is this idea of not allowing work to take up all of my time. The tool I mentioned in self-awareness episode uh, and uh, a self-awareness tool that we can use in self-management as well, this whole life grid is very useful here. That's nine boxes, put in nine different things that you can spend your time doing over the course of a day or a week. And that'll help you maybe live to your mission statement. Writing your own inspiring mission statement can be daunting, I suppose, in in how it sounds. But the best thing to do is start with writing down your values, what comes into your mind, what's important to you, why is it important, and why do you want to do these things? Because the want piece is very, very important because you'll keep doing it if you want to do it. Do this for your professional career or your personal career. Get a coach. They'll help you with this. 
there's lots of tools and sometimes coaching can be a key thing here because you could do it on your own but it's the accountability piece that can sometimes wane so put together a mission statement another example of how you can develop your self-esteem is to work on your image we feel better and more self-confident when we know we look good and that is very true everyone can make the most of what they have without being a model of physical attractiveness point in case uh, this person talking and it costs you nothing to smile to be tidy to be neat to put on your best foot forward maybe and be genuine and carry yourself proudly so work on your your body language and i find a lot of the time if you take a video of yourself now with our ubiquitous smartphones and camera phones video yourself doing a presentation even if it's a two-minute presentation and looking at it back and just seeing what what do you see back when you're doing the presentation what are the things going on in your head when you actually look at it back you might see things differently it may not have been as that bad as you thought and you can pick out certain areas after a while when you get over that self-consciousness of hearing your own voice or seeing yourself you start to notice areas you can tweak and improve and I, I firmly believe it's getting over that initial hump of the discomfort or, or, or of seeing and hearing yourself then you start forgetting about that and moving forward into the areas you can improve here's another interesting one identify someone you have been too timid around write a script for how you might speak up around that person practice your script aloud in private and then get your thoughts out with some conviction. Don't worry about the words. Seek out this person and state the opinions or feelings you previously did not voice. Never state your opinion in a dogmatic or aggressive way, but merely in a businesslike way. For example, this is an example that I've pulled out. So Karen, I've been thinking about the plans we discussed last week, and I wanted to share my opinion. I think we should try to do this project in-house rather than go with a subcontractor. And here's why bang 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 you'd lay out the options and, and points that you thought about and a lot of this comes into being prepared maybe you're going into a meeting with your boss or some on the team that there might be conflict and it's been in your mind for a while but what have you done to plan for that what steps have you taken to write down how you're going to approach it even five minutes to brainstorm these are the things i will talk about these are the questions i predict will come up and these are the ways i would answer it so a lot of it is about planning and knowing what you want to get out of it and not overthinking about the actual event but think about the outcome another one that comes up a lot especially with introverts um, is this one if you don't speak up in meetings you must begin to do so resolve to contribute something in every meeting you attend beyond merely just asking a question Try this. Get an agenda ahead of time. Pick an issue or a topic that you know something about or care about and plan ahead what you're going to say in that meeting. Even if you don't know much about the other issues, do your homework, learn more by researching or talking to a colleague, rehearse what you will say, plant it in your mind and say that you can do this, I will do this. And then when it comes around, speak up and voice your concerns or voice your opinion. This isn't easy at the start, but it definitely gets better and easier over time as you build that confidence and your self-esteem will come along with it. I think that's a really useful one and it's one, as I said, I hear a lot of people just biting their tongue, coming out of a meeting, saying I should have said something there, but I didn't. I've gone as far as trying to put a measure against it, that if somebody feels they've done that once every day or once a week in a meeting, that's your measure, that's your metric to try and improve. So next time round, how many times in the week can you actually feel that and break through and track it over time? Great opportunity to, to, to kind of make that move forward and improve there. Just a couple more. Seek out opportunities to make presentations. One of the scariest things people can do is presentations statistically. But if you go after it and look for opportunities to do it in a safer environment, perhaps, that will help. Take anything you can do well and know quite a bit about and then offer to present that subject at a staff meeting or an appropriate small group forum. 
again, care about what you're talking about, have passion about it, have been instrumental in putting it together, you quickly forget about what other people are thinking. You want to get your message across. That is very important. Start small, even do it one-to-one. Do it on your video phone, watch back, do it one-to-one, and then try and expand out. And that's why Toastmasters and other presentation styled uh, groups are brilliant and give you that uh, experimental environment to test things out. As always, smile. Don't forget to breathe because when we hold our breath, we run out of oxygen and that's not a good look. Like any goal, they can be seemingly very, very large at the start, but you got to break it down. So whatever your big goal is, then with a smart technique, break it down into smaller bite-sized chunks and incrementally improve and move towards that over a period of time. So this goes back to goal setting. And a lot of this is planning and being meticulous in how you get there. Don't worry about the big elephant. Just bite it a little bit at a time, as they say, and move forward. And then the final piece to develop this, again, goes to measurement. And we'll talk about measuring in a second. But keep a log of all the progress you've made. Whatever that is on a day-by-day basis over a week, write stuff down, reflect on it, get a sense of your mood, get a sense of your improvement, and just get into the habit of that. The more you can connect each individual experience with your goal, the closer you will be to achieving it. And I, you know, all of this sounds very practical, very straightforward, and it is. There's not so much science or or so much magic in this. It's about being meticulous, deliberate, and tracking it. And that's where coaching comes in very helpful sometimes with people uh, because they need somebody to help them along the way or at least get the ball rolling absolutely critical and hopefully that gives you a sense of some good tools or techniques you can use when you are looking to develop self-esteem okay so just lastly of this one like all of the competencies that we talk about there's measurements that you can use that can give you a sense of how you're doing or give you a baseline and self-esteem is is no different in fact there's one very well-known one that comes with measuring self-esteem it's called the rosenberg scale and that goes back to the gentleman i think it was nathaniel rosenberg maybe i got his name wrong but it's rosenberg his name is very much tied to self-esteem and it is a scale you can absolutely use Uh, The self-esteem is the Rosenberg scale. It's a 10-item measure with a long history and well-documented reliability. So the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, or RSES, it was developed in the 1960s by Morris Rosenberg, not Nathaniel, sorry. The scale assesses global self-esteem. Rosenberg and his fellow researchers define global self-esteem as the individual's positive and negative attitude towards the self as a totality. Rosenberg and colleagues distinguish between the goal, the global and specific self-esteem. They agree that the interrelated nature of the two is possible. They also argue that the that treating these constructs as though they are interchangeable devalues them both as separate phenomenon. And it goes on into more scientific detail uh, and explanations of that. But I think it's probably just worth checking it out. I'll put a link to it. The 10 points are pretty straightforward. Um, Here's some examples. I feel that I am a person of worth, at least on an equal plane with others, and you have your strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. I feel that I have several good qualities. All in all, I am inclined to feel that I'm a failure. They're the type of questions in the RSES questionnaire. It's available online. You can take it. It'll give you a starting point. And then over time, maybe it's something you can take again and see if you're moving in the right direction. So there we go. That is a self-esteem run through. And I think I originally started to put this one down as a one episode. It's kind of into the hour mark, so I might break it into two Hopefully it was useful, as is always the case. I'm learning a little bit more myself as I go through this and talking it out helps. If you have a self-esteem expert or if you have self-esteem questions that you'd like me to ask somebody, let me know. I think it's um, it's an important area and I hope you've learned something from it. Thanks for listening. Links with the show notes. And the next one up is an episode on self-efficacy. 
Till then, thank you. Good luck. Hey folks, thanks so much for listening to the show. If you enjoyed it, could you please consider helping me extend the reach of the podcast that a little bit further? You can do that in a number of ways. The number one way is to subscribe on your app of choice. This helps me with the chart ranking, leading to more folks stumbling across the podcast and checking it out. You could also repost it on your social media channels. Any of them would be great. And maybe even tell a friend in person or over the phone, pick up the phone, give them a call and tell them about the 1% Better podcast. Tell them about this episode or one that you've heard in the past. Annie will do. I would really appreciate it. In the last year, we set up a 1% Better Slack community, which you can join for free and interact with me and other members of the community and improve through holding each other accountable and sharing monthly challenges. It's a lot of fun. Check it out. I'm into season four of this incredible journey and the more of these interviews and solo shows that I research, record and share, the better I believe that they get and more loaded with actionable takeaways that you can learn from. I know I've learned so much from it so far, and it's always really, really fulfilling and rewarding when I hear from you on what you took from it. So do reach out, rob at robofthegreen.ie. And of everybody that listens, 90% listen and enjoy, but only around 10% actually take action, write down takeaways and put them into practice. I am convinced that if we can move that number a bit higher, the listeners will not only make steps forward towards their goals, but they will be more fulfilled and happy and better. Change doesn't happen overnight. It is hard, but it's all about taking the first step, whatever that is for you. You can absolutely do this. Make a plan, be deliberate, take action. Don't overreach. Start with those small incremental improvements and over time you will see great progress. It's all in the pursuit of betterness. So again, thank you so much for listening. Good luck and stay safe.